Thank you. Definitely. So, good morning, everyone. Um, this is the the DIRIP meeting or the ARIP working group. So that's the first meeting. Um, it's um, going to be virtual, but I hope we're going to make uh, as good as the other meetings we, we, we had during this ITF. So I think everyone can see my slides. Um, just a, a few few advice recommendations. I think they've already been provided by uh, on the pre-session slide. So make sure your video is off. Um, mute the, com the the mic and unless you are talking. Um, yeah, the the chat on the WebEx is going to be mostly used for um, for the queue to manage the queue. So you will add a plus queue if you want to be in that queue and a minus queue if you want to remove from that queue. Um, on the chat, you can see um, the etherpad. So that's uh, what we use for the blue sheet. So make sure you put your names and affiliations to that uh, etherpad. The link is on the um, the link is on the um, on the chat. Um, let me check that. But um, I think well, you probably. Uh, can check that on the site. So any uh, discussions that are going to be outside, um, I mean, during the conference, uh, during the meeting, uh, should not be in the chat of the WebEx, but uh, rather in the Jabber room. So um, if you if you could connect to Jabber, it would be good. Um, let's start with the not well. So I think everyone is um, pretty much aware of this slide, um, it's uh, the meeting is being recorded. I, I'm. I think the secretary is. Um, I don't have to push on any button. It's uh, the secretary is handling that. Um, then the agenda. So today we have. Um, so we are looking. So we are looking for minute takers. Do we have any volunteers? Not hearing anyone. Daniel, I will take minutes, but I'm not ready yet. But okay, continue without me. Me. Okay, thank you, Michael. So the Jabber, um, um, Med, could you can you maybe look at the Jabber? I will look at the Jabber. Okay, thank you, Michael. So the agenda is going to be mostly focused on the, um, on two drafts that are currently um, uh, working progress. Um, one is based on the requirement, and the other one on the architecture. So that's really much um, what the, uh, we would like to be to, to have this session being focused on. Um, then there are also some ongoing works that are more in the solution space, but we would like to. We only would like to to have those presentations if time permits. So, the working group. How do we work now? So we have two chairs, myself, and uh, Med. Um, so welcome, Med. And uh, we also would like to thank uh, Gonzalo for um, launching the working group. Um, so the name with well, the working group has a new name. So um, it used to be called the MRID. So now when you're updating the draft, just make sure you're using the, the appropriate um, acronym. Um, another thing, it's it's expected to be um, um, a work a working group that is making is going to be working with um, virtual meetings and interim meetings. So. Um, we're going to send a doodle, um, and we would like to understand um, what what are the time zone preference. So uh, I'm based in uh, Montreal, so Eastern Coast, and um, my co-chair is um, located in Europe. Um, so if you, we have uh, any other time zones uh, that we should um, take into consideration, 
um, please uh, send us an email. Um, um, if you're also willing to co-author a document, it would be really appreciated uh, um, that you can, I mean, you could even either contact directly the, um, the, the, the authors, the co-authors. Um, I'm sure they're going to be very uh, welcoming that, but um, I mean, if you, you don't feel that he's contacting those, um, the co-authors directly, um, please feel, feel free to contact the chairs and uh, we will try to, to make that happen. Um, one of the reasons we would like, not everyone is, might come from the ITF, so um, I mean, we would like to make those adjustments. So, I mean, uh, the chairs are here to make the work happen. So, I mean, you, you should feel really free to contact us uh, at any time. And um, if you are sending us an email and you don't receive a response within, let's say, 24 hours, um, resend the email. It's probably that we have missed the email rather than we don't want to answer it. Um, the use of GitHub. Um, so if um, authors are confident with using GitHub, we are fine with that. So um, there are some recommendations here that you might have a look to, but um, I mean, uh, we are not pushing for, we are not um, pushing against. So as mentioned before, the, during this meeting, what we would like to have is a common understanding of the working group mission. And we would like to agree on the working group priorities to achieve these goals and agree on the time frame to find, um, finalize those work items. So the mission is uh, from the charter. Uh, so, we have requirements, architecture, and protocol design. And um, so, today, we will uh, focus on the requirements and the architecture. Um, this is going to be the first focus. And um, what we would like to is have the problem to be understood by all ITF members. Um, and not only lead people very much involved with uh, uh, the RIP. So um, that's clearly what we are aiming at. So if you're not familiar with drones, it doesn't mean this work working group is not for you or that you can't help us. Um, and we need to have those requirements be um, clear for anyone, almost anyone um, within the ITF. Uh, same for the architecture. And because um, we're trying to solve not a drone problem, but a, a networking issue. So the milestones we envision are um, adoption um, in April 2020 of the uh, requirements and the architecture uh, documents. And we would like those documents to be uh, finalized um, during a working group like last call for July 2020. Um, it doesn't mean it's the other work can't start in parallel, but uh, we would like the working group to be focused on those two. And um, we don't want to spend too much time on the, uh, those two documents. So if um, there there is only one thing that one message I, I would like to, to provide is that if you don't get something, I mean, it's going to be helpful you raise your, uh, your hand and uh, discuss this. So, yeah. Um, we're pleading with you to please put it in full screen. There's the full screen button, the arrows and all right, okay. I think. So um, uh, full screen. And you should just be able to page up and okay. page down. Okay, this is the full screen. So I think that's my last slide. So it's open for discussion. And um, I suggest we start. So um, let's start with the requirements. Um, is it Adam or Stu presenting the requirements? Stu will be presenting. We're sharing a conference room. OK. Um, can you take the ball, or do you want me to, to move the slides? Uh, the recommendations from the secretariat had been to have the chairs continue to actually drive the slides and for the speaker okay. to just say next. So that's what I'll do. I'm opening. All right, so while you do that, I'll start talking, though. Um, since this is the first meeting of the working group and we have some new participants, 
And there is indeed significant background and context from the um, unmanned aircraft system world that uh, a little of that is needed to understand what's going on. Uh, I'll go through some of that, um, which means I'm going to have to move really fast. And I will probably say some things that are controversial. And I'm up for a fight, but not today in our limited time. Um, so next. The other button, Daniel. The, the top one. Yeah, that. This one is full screen, but uh, to move slides, oh, okay. There we go. Um, you so, might have to hit minus, uh, make the slides. Yeah, you might have to shrink it down a little bit. There we go. I, I apologize for this first one, but it's necessary. It's not necessary for us to walk through them all right now, but I'm hoping people will look at these slides again after today's meeting. Um, this alphabet soup um, is necessary in order to understand what's going on in, in the drone world. Uh, there's only two things that I want to highlight right now. The unmanned aircraft, the UA, is the physical drone itself. It's the part that takes off. The GCS, the ground control station, is the thing that the pilot uses to operate the aircraft. And when you put the two of these things together, that's what's called the UAS, the unmanned aircraft system. The other thing I want to point out is that very central to all of this is what's called the USS, the UAS service supplier, which you can think of as a service bureau that offers a collection of services that relate to the safe and economical flight of unmanned aircraft. And there's a lot of different information services involved that, that support that. Next. Okay, uh, remote ID is critical for uh, integrating these things into the controlled national airspace and flying them below 400 feet. That's here in the US. May, different numbers may apply in other jurisdictions. Um, let's say that I'm a fireman and I'm at a fire and I see this aircraft hovering over the fire. I don't know whether that was brought by some other department that responded to the same fire, or if it's one of the local news media, or if it's some gawker, or maybe it's the arsonist who set the fire. I really need to find out some information about that aircraft and who's flying it and why. And to start, I need to simply identify the aircraft. There's a lot of different uh, stakeholders, if you will, that need this for a lot of different reasons. Um, and there's a kind of a, a loop here in that there's information that people are going to act upon. They need to be able to trust that information. Trust begins with identity. So then the identity itself needs to be trusted. Next. Uh, Daniel, before you hit next. Oh, sorry. Yeah, hit the uh, full screen button again on the uh, thing because it popped it out. There you there go. There we go. Beautiful. Now you can use it. Okay, now next, please. Now next. Okay. This is a complex and rapidly changing environment. Uh, all of the pieces are in, at best, loosely coupled development, even within the Federal Aviation Administration, which is the civil aviation um, uh, authority in the United States. There's different branches of the FAA that are using different nomenclature and going in different directions. And so then when you add that this is actually a global problem, it gets worse. Um, we've got a lot of things in the UAS traffic management world that are moving fast and disjointedly. Um, and then trust frameworks, those are still being defined. And the major effort in that area is coming from the International Civil Aviation Organization, which has come up with, well, which is developing their ICAO trust framework and their global resilient aviation interoperable network. Um, and we're gonna try to hook up with those people. And then there's on beyond um, UTM, which is unmanned aircraft system traffic management. There are a lot of people who are saying that UTM is the future of ATM, air traffic management. In other words, manned aircraft as well, because we are confronting problems of scalability in UTM that are soon going to be encountered in manned aviation due to the introduction of what's being called urban air mobility. Think robotic air taxis flying around in dense urban areas. Next. Okay, so um, again, this is the US-centric view of the world, but there are corresponding things going on in Europe and elsewhere. This is the UTM Pilot Project 2 architecture. If you look on the right-hand side towards the center vertically, there is the UAS service supplier, the USS, and you can see the central role that it plays in all this. There will be multiple UASs, I'm sorry, USSs, uh, interacting in a so-called inter-USS network. Each one of those USSs will be supporting multiple UAS operators, and except for hobbyists, each one of those UAS operators will typically be running multiple UAS. So we do face a lot of scalability issues here. Next. Next slide, if you would, Daniel. 
Okay, so there's a key standard here. Um, the former uh, American Society for Testing and Materials, which is now called simply ASTM International, published in December their standard specification for remote ID and tracking. This is their first version. They know that there's going to need to be revisions. Um, this is a technical specification, not a regulation. More on that later. It's really focused on message formats, and it introduces two types of remote ID, broadcast and network. Broadcast comes direct from the actual flying aircraft. It goes over a data link, not a network, to the observer's device directly. It has to support Bluetooth 4. It has to support Wi-Fi. It optionally can support Bluetooth 5. But anytime you're broadcasting on Bluetooth 5, you're required to also concurrently be broadcasting on Bluetooth 4. Um, and because these are unpaired devices, you know, you're not going to pair each aircraft with each observer's smartphone on the ground. That means it's limited to using the Bluetooth 4 advertisement frames, the, the beacon frames. They're very short. We only get 24 bytes usable out of each one of them. And even if you page it, it's still not much. Um, network remote ID, on the other hand, uh, uses the internet explicitly, not just IP connectivity in general, but it uses the internet. And it involves a service provider that gathers information from different aircraft in an area and a display provider, which aggregates information from multiple service providers and coughs it up in a form usable by uh, observers. And it's JSON and REST and so on. The thing is, this standard punts the security methods to the implementers. It specifies the framing. It shows you how many bytes you get for authentication data and where they go in the message format, and that's where it stops. That's on purpose because they don't want to um, prevent uh, taking advantage of advances in crypto, uh, and they don't want to overspecify, but it means that there is no interoperability yet from just following this standard. That's one area where we want to help. Next slide, please. Okay, this is broadcast remote ID. It's a very simple case. There's an aircraft in the air. It's being controlled over a command and control link, which is typically two-way by somebody on the ground, and the aircraft is broadcasting one way to any observer that's within range that has loaded a broadcast RID receiver app onto their smartphone, their tablet, or whatever other receiver device. This one is highly constrained in terms of range and Bluetooth 4 packet size and so on, but it's simple, uh, very easy to understand. Next slide, please. So we didn't hear the last sentence you mentioned. Oh, I'm sorry. This one is very simple to comprehend, but it is highly constrained with respect to uh, Bluetooth 4. Next slide. Can you mute? Um, let's see. So I'll start talking on this slide while um, this one is network remote ID. And I recommend that you focus on the lower two thirds of the slide, not the top third. The top third is again, US FAA unique. It is how they anticipate that federal users who will have special God powers will interact with the rest of the system. Whereas uh, the bottom layer that you see here is the individual UAS operators. Uh, and then the middle layer is the, the center of the, of the UTM universe is the multiple USSs, the UAS service suppliers. Now you notice that the one in the middle is uh, receiving uh, remote ID information from the UASs that uh, it is working with, and it's sharing that information, the NetRid transmit service with other USSs. The one on the left is doing the same thing, and it is also providing network RID display service to that guy over on the left who wants some um, situational awareness on what's going on in the air. And then the one way over on the right, that's not serving any UAS operators at all. It's serving some member of the general public that just wants to know what's that nasty buzzing sound over his head and who's doing it. Next slide, please. Okay. There's a difference here between the regulations and the industry consensus standards. They're intended to complement each other. Um, the regulators, such as the European Union Aviation Safety Agency and the US FAA, they mandate what you've got to do and how well you've got to do it. Whereas the ASTM and others provide technical specifications that detail one or more ways that you might use. And the regulators can designate specific industry standards as, quote, accepted means of compliance. What that means is, if I buy my drone from a manufacturer who provides me with a certificate that asserts that he is complying with ASTM F4.1 
3411-19, then neither I nor the manufacturer need to prove to the FAA that we comply with their regulation. Um, there's slightly different terminology between the regulations and the technical specifications, but then there are some actual meaningful differences. For instance, within the ASTM standard, there are three UAS ID types. Type one is a static manufacturer assigned hardware serial number per yet another external standard from the Consumer Technology Association. In Europe, you are required to use that one. In the US, you are allowed to use that one. Type two is your aviation regulators assigned ID, which ASTM thought that the aviation agencies were gonna to wanna to do this, they don't want to. Neither Europe nor the United States allows this. Type three is not allowed in Europe but it is actually encouraged under a slightly different definition in the United States um, by, the, by the FAA. So here's an important point. Whatever gets communicated to the regulars in the next few months is gonna affect the regulations they write that in turn are gonna reflect the technical standards that we and ASTM write that are gonna define what the manufacturers actually build that are then gonna be flying for the next 10 years. So we're having to move extremely fast here and yet if we get it wrong, we're gonna to have to live with it for 10 years or more. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's just a mapping of the rows being uh, regulations versus the columns being uh, technical standards. And clearly there are some differences between Europe and the United States, and there are some differences between the so-called limited grid and the standard grid operations in the US. Limited grid means if I'm gonna fly a small aircraft, they can not fly very fast and not fly very far and not fly very high, and I keep it within my own visual line of sight as I fly it, well, then I can fly under the limited rule, limited grid rules. If I go outside that exception, I have to use the standard grid rules, which are a little bit more demanding. Now, um, the, NP, the notice of proposed rulemaking says that RID is an enabler of various other applications, whereas ASTM says RID is just RID. It's an end in itself. The NPRM calls for error correction, but the ASTM standard doesn't specify any. The NPRM calls for cybersecurity, whatever that means, but they do at least say specifically that they want to protect both integrity and authenticity. The ASTM standard, again, punts how to do that and only shows you the framing of your auth data. And everybody says we should protect the operator privacy. But when you're running broadcast remote ID, it broadcasts the pilot GCS location in the clear to anyone with a receiver device. We could easily envision a situation where something as bad is done by one drone pilot and uh, a mob descends with baseball bats on another drone pilot. Um, and furthermore, no one specifies how to protect personally identifiable information in the registries. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this is where the registries get involved. Once um, an aircraft has been identified using the UAS remote identification methods, Somebody then uses that identifier as a unique key to look stuff up. And who's allowed to look up what is all TBD, but it's a distributed data store where each registry, each USS is gonna have the um, initial entry that came from the operator when he registered. And then somehow we have to go across this inter-USS network, which will be the internet of course, but an overlay um, to, to get what we want. And there need to be some kind of access controls and logs and so on. Now in the US, um, the idea is that the USSs will be required to retain information for exactly six months. No more, no less. Because if there needs to be an inquiry into an accident, presumably it'll get started in less than six months. And after six months, we don't want this being used for you know, other purposes. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're wrapping up the requirements presentation in the next couple of slides. From all of the foregoing, which is essentially background, context, use cases, I have derived, and this is just me, and I'm sure I got it wrong, uh, eight general requirements for DRIP. And this is, uh, they're shown on the slide and they're in the corresponding um, DRIP requirements draft. I really, really need people to help me scrub these. Um, and now in addition to the eight fundamental requirements, there's a desirement. If broadcast rig receivers can accurately date time and location stamp what they received and relay them, then that allows us to do all kinds of additional cool stuff about much more later. Next slide, please. 
Okay, these are requirements not on drip in general, but on the identifier. For instance, the first requirement is that it be 20 bytes or smaller. That's all we get. Um, and that is because of the constraints of the Bluetooth 4 framing. And then it needs to be able to, it needs to enable us to do things uh, with it uh, in terms of uniqueness. Um, the first bullet there after the numbered requirements, we don't want to facilitate adversarial correlation uh, uh, with uh, patterns of life. Basically, Amazon doesn't want Walmart to be able to figure out where they every day fly their delivery drones and vice versa. And that's a commercial example. They're obviously also uh, governmental examples. Um, and next slide, please. Okay, this is a recap. This is an important problem. It's an urgent problem because the European regulations already were issued and they already took effect almost a year ago and they take full effect in a couple of months. The US regulations have been proposed um, just two months ago and the final rules are expected um, about a year from now. And we're gonna be locked in to what the manufacturers actually build you know, in the next couple of years for many years after that. ASTM did good work, but insufficient work. It doesn't enable you to trust this information it doesn't enable you to figure out whether the operator is trusted if you're out in the middle of the woods. And it doesn't enable you to instantly establish communications with the pilot so you can ask him what he's doing or tell him to get out of that airspace or tell him to land or whatever. Now, a thing that I've learned in a career of aviation networking is that aviators understand push to talk analog voice radios. They do not understand networking. That is changing as a new generation moves into the field, but they really need our help here. Um, we can leverage existing internet stuff. We can strengthen the authentication and balance privacy with need to know. We can generalize to support a variety of other applications. We can extend it all with broadcast and network gateways and multilateration so we can get independent confirmation of the otherwise purely operator provided claims of position and velocity and so on. Now, because mapping the physical location of an aircraft to an aircraft's ID is kind of similar to mapping, it's an inverse problem, a, an internet host's logical location or IP address to a host's ID that inspired us to look at HIP. And we've been moving fast outside the IETF with developing and testing code slower within the IETF because we badly need reviewers and co-authors. Um, we've actually already flown more than once a HIP-based extension to uh, Gabriel Cox of Intel's open drone ID at the New York Unmanned Aircraft System test site, uh, which is a half, one of a half a dozen such sites around the United States. Um, that are testing integration of unmanned aircraft with uh, manned airspace. Anyway, bottom line, we badly need your help. Reviewers, authors, implementers, testers, I'm done. Thank you. Yes, so I think we will go now to the questions, to the line. Um, I only see one person into the line. Hi, Daniel. This is Jim Reed. I okay. Go, Jim. Hand up. I go ahead. I hope you can hear me. I'm using yeah. my phone to dial in. My question is a simple one. Is how is this uh, working group going to interact with all of these aviation safety authorities and bodies like the ICAO? How is this kind of discussion and dialogue going to take place over the course of the coming months? So Stu here, um, several of us have joined ASTM International and are participating in committee F38.02, which is UAS operations. And they were the ones who wrote the ASTM F3411-19 standard and will be revising it. There's a meeting of that committee in about a week and a half and it's gonna be virtual. It was gonna be right here in upstate New York. We will be actively participating. We are also, um, thanks to some of the other people who are actually participating, I see through Jabber, um, we're gonna be hooking in with uh, ICIO and others. That's about as much as I can say right now, there are no formal liaisons in place. Um, they would probably be appropriate, but I as a relative noob to the IETF um, am, am not the right one to, to push that.
Fatah uh, here. I'd like to uh, ask about uh, so the regulation and measures of compliance, and specifically uh, number five in your list of uh, general requirements, um, structuring information for human and machine readability. Can you elaborate very uh, uh, concisely on that? Uh, we specifically have a way to contribute to that with uh, uh, work that we've been doing over the past while in fully free open source licensing. Uh, but do you have any, can you summarize what's already going on there? Yes, Stu here again. Um, so the way UAS RID was contemplated by the regulators and apparently by ASTM is that we were going to get an ID, it was going to be unique, um, it was going to be presented to human eyeballs, humans were then going to be able to do a lookup in a registry, human eyeballs again were then going to read the information that was in that registry which would contain, oh for instance, a telephone number, the humans were then going to pick up a telephone, call the telephone number, and um, interact with the party on the other end who has some responsibility for the safe operation of that aircraft. Now, if I'm a hobbyist and I'm out, you know, flying my model and my phone rings, I'm not answering my phone while I'm flying my model airplane. So that's, you know, the first uh, weakness that we see with that. So what we have added to the discussion is this idea that if you make this information machine readable, now I could have, you know, if I'm, uh, I don't know, a firefighter at the scene, a one button way of contacting the uh, aircraft's uh, operator, uh, pilot in command, whatever. And this is certainly not yet defined in either the regulators' minds or the ASTM's uh, mind. It's, it's something that we've added to the discussion. Okay, okay so, so I thought, uh, without going into details here, um, we have uh, done some work where the ID can be associated with a control table very concisely expressed in JSON or CBOR. Um, and part of our team uh, is actually actively involved in the uh, drone racing community. Um, and so in terms of uh, associating a control table with an ID, uh, we could then uh, keep within your 20 byte uh, limit and uh, have some core elements of say EU regulations, US regulations or other jurisdiction regulations associated with that ID. Welcome to the team. I look forward to many fruitful discussions. Oh, yeah, so yeah, just, uh, keep, keep us in, uh, I'll follow up with an email, but uh, uh, keep us informed of the deadlines and so forth. And anyway, uh, so my, I'm the Executive Director for Excellent Algorithms Foundation, and uh, we'll be happy to meet your deadlines with uh, free open source licensed methods of doing this. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, so next in the queue, I think it's uh, Stewart. I'm curious as to whether there are any plans to either have a proxy, uh, ground-based proxy for this, or a um, some other system, because some of the uh, drones that are flown are uh, very, very lightweight. I mean, just over 250, 250 grams is the unlimited UK um, size, but just over that, um, having power to transmit and uh, any sensible distance and having the weight of the equipment uh, could be a problem. Do here again. Yes, absolutely. Uh, some of these things are very small, very light, have very small batteries. Um, they're already over constrained and putting anything else on them is just a non-starter. Uh, many of them are not retrofittable, um, the, these legacy things. And so I, I, I'm rarely one to give uh, government agencies much credit. But in this case, I say that I think it was a stroke of brilliance on the part of the FAA to allow, perhaps less brilliant to require, um, network grid as the baseline mode of operation and to allow that network grid to be sent uh, from any part of the UAS, meaning it doesn't have to come from the unmanned aircraft, it can come from the ground control station. So what this allows is I can define my cell phone as being part of my ground control station, even if it has no connectivity with my aircraft, and I can sit there and fly my aircraft with a joystick with my right hand, and with my left hand operate my smartphone and uh, cause it to push into the network remote ID system my location and my aircraft has to be within 400 feet of me if I'm operating under these limited rules here in the United States. How this is going to be handled in other jurisdictions is as yet unclear. 
add to this interesting EMI problems associated with mobile phones being on the flight line, and some operators regard them as uh, as unsafe. Roger that. So next on the queue. Yeah, this is, uh, I think it's me, Shrey. Yeah, that's Sylvia. Uh, Shrey, so, um, so it, I think it's worth mentioning the other still is also using the same uh, ID, uh, things like S the 3GPP, and we actually uh, try to uh, find a way to uh, use the similar um, uh, ID from ESTM to do some sort of uh, authentication. So um, what I'm saying is trying, this might be keep uh, those information in handy, uh, right? Uh, make sure our work is uh, aligned uh, with the, the general purpose of the IDs. I'm hoping that you can connect us with that because that's something of which I was not previously aware. Thank you. Uh, that's not a problem. So I'm, I'm taking SA1, SA, uh, SA2, SA6, so both of them uh, working on the remote ID in different aspects, but uh, we can definitely talk more uh, offline. We look forward to your emails. You can either contact myself, uh, Adam, or Stu on that, and we can interact. Yeah, and for not only that, but other reasons of which we were previously aware, we see you as playing a key role in connecting the different communities here. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, but I would uh, love to contribute. Yeah, I would. Um, I mean, I, I would encourage uh, to have that discussion through the mailing list uh, so that everyone can take part of it. Um, oh, of course, yeah. If if that's possible, I mean, um, it, it's fine contacting the the Adam and Stuart, but um, I mean, it would be even better bring this community uh, to the discussion as well. So I would encourage to have those on the mailing list. I agree. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, just so everybody knows, um, although it is the DRIP working group and its primary work product is expected to be a DRIP protocol, the mailing list is still tm-rid at ietf.org. And it's relatively low volume, so don't fear that if you get in there, you're going to be spammed. Yeah. Anas? Um, hi, um, I have a question regarding the communication technology you're using. Uh, you mentioned Bluetooth. Um, is that um, like that's from the drone to where and what other um, communication technologies are in use? Yes, so um, the ASTM took its lead from both the European and American uh, regulators who said it's critically important that first responders, firemen, police, et cetera, be able to identify these aircraft using devices that they can reasonably be expected to already have on their person. And that meant, unfortunately, uh, Bluetooth 4. And uh, so that's a direct Bluetooth 4 transmission from the aircraft to the observer's body-worn handheld device. Bluetooth 5 is also in their spec, and Wi-Fi with neighbor awareness networking is in their spec. And there have been discussions within ASTM about allowing or even requiring other media, but that's the technical specification as it stands in the December 2019 version. Now that's for broadcast RID. For network RID, anything that'll get you on the internet is fine. Thanks. So Next. Uh, Joseph Papa here with Excel Algorithms. So in terms of the uh, getting um, the communication going on with any device, uh, the way we've approached that is uh, we've separated out the uh, kind of a, a specification for rule makers and a specification for rule takers. And uh, we're doing, we've got um, reference implementations of each but that uh, effectively a specification or component uh, for a rule taker can then be uh, either in, uh, created in or uh, you know, recreated in some fashion or other in any device. That's the idea.
Um, so this is Adam here. I think Zhao is next in the queue line, I believe. Uh, no, I I have finished my uh, quarter. I think it's a Stefan. Um, Stefan Wenger, Tencent. Um, so while I understand that a lot of organizations seem to believe that there is a value in having something like a broadcast uh, rip, um, I'm uh, I'm I'm a little bit less sure about that. Um, I mean, considering the speed of the internet and the fairly fairly wide um, availability of internet connected connected devices to people like firefighters, um, rather than jumping through the hoops and like, expecting every drone to have a Bluetooth interface, which they simply don't right now, um, why not? Uh, um, when we're sending out uh, information about the drone uh, over the internet anyway, uh, why not query that information, including a slightly delayed broadcast information through the internet from a UUS? Thank you. Uh, I have to give, I guess, about three answers to this question. First off, I agree with some of your thinking, but second, the decision-making is kind of above our pay grade with the regulators. Um, and thirdly, um, I think that there, there's, there's a lot of back pressure in the United States against the FAA saying that you must do network. Uh, and I think there's some back pressure in Europe against them saying that you must do broadcast. The original recommendations uh, were to allow either for you know, small aircraft flying you know, at low altitudes and so on, but to require both for larger aircraft flying at, at, at higher altitudes and so on. And you know, perhaps uh, that is the way that it will go. Uh, but I do want to make the point that there are areas of interest where there really isn't ubiquitous internet connectivity. I'm aware, for instance, of one Air Force base in California that is thousands of acres, and there, there's there's just not ubiquitous LTE over that base. And if somebody you know sees an aircraft, um, they still want to be able to identify it. So um, yeah, so so I I do have a, a, a little question, um, um, and I'm not I'm not sure it's um, out of scope of the, the drip um, concern, and um, I'm I'm just wondering is that well currently we're seeing uh, yeah this is me this is uh, and providing some uh, identity information to to an observer, but um is it outside of the scope of this work to ask some kind of authorization to go into some areas. So that is strictly speaking outside of the scope of UAS RID, but within the scope of UTM, uh, UAS traffic management. UAS traffic management is all about saying, mother may I fly in the following aircraft four dimensional volume, right? Latitude, longitude, altitude, and time. And originally UTM and UAS remote ID were contemplated as two entirely separate animals, but there has been increasing awareness over the last year, especially the last six months, that they really need to be um, integrated. Okay. okay. That's currently out of scope. Well, it is out of scope for ASTM's F38.02 work item 65041. Exactly what is in scope for DRIP, I think, remains a subject for discussion. Okay. Okay, so let's conclude this work on um, the requirement. Um, so I think, well, we need some, um, you, we need, you need to have the, the requirements more specific. That's my, um, my, um, my view uh, regarding the document. So, um, we, we, we really need the people that are online and on the mailing list to have the, those discussions um, and to, to see whether, I mean, the first, first things could be, you look at the requirements and you, you may be asked for clarifications um, and provide feedback so that the co-author can respond and adjust the requirements. Um, so we have something that we can build an architecture on. So check that your use case is really fits um, with the requirements and 
move this way. That's uh, how I see the work being um, conducted. Now, I think we can move to the architecture. So that's the requirements. Is that the architecture? That is. You know, could yeah. I, we just remind people that you need to plus Q in the channel, and I think you need to actually tell us who this, if you're doing speaker Q, are you doing speaker Q? I don't know who's doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing the speaker Q then. Then you probably need to tell people who's next because we've had people. Okay, that but we close the line. I know you close the line. I'm just saying okay. for the next iteration. That's all. Okay, right. people that they need to plus Q in the WebEx if they want to speak. Awesome. Okay. Presentation. And uh, it's also. Uh, uh, and please say your name as your first yeah, thing exactly. when you speak because I'll have I may not know who your handle is. Okay, so it just. Okay. Okay, Stu here again. First thing I want to say is that both of my drafts suck. They suck for two reasons. First off, this is the first time I've ever written uh, internet drafts. And secondly, up until five days ago, I had essentially no reviews. Uh, thank you very much to those who did provide reviews in the last five days. And I will be banging out uh, new versions of both drafts this weekend based upon that. But I wasn't quite able to squeeze it out in between, you know, when I received that information and, and this moment. So um, architecture, you saw the caveat on the cover slide that because we've been needing to move very fast, we have been doing solution space work in parallel with requirements work. So um, I was asked to do a reference architecture, um, but I, I didn't know that that was what I was supposed to be doing until like less than 48 hours ago. So I don't really have one. What I have here is on this slide, basically just the cast of characters. Um, the aircraft itself is the source of broadcast grid uh, up on top. Over on the left, when I say pilot or operator is a label on any of the stick figures in these cartoons, I'm referring to several different entities that often will be identical, but even when they're not identical, they'll generally be co-located. The operator is typically a corporation, uh, the owner or the lessee of, of the aircraft. The pilot in command is the one that the um, courts are going to hold responsible for the safe uh, flight of the aircraft. The remote pilot, who might be the same guy as the, as the pilot in command or might be a different one operating under his supervision, is the one who's actually operating the controls. The ground control station, the GCS, is the controls. And finally, this is typically the source of network remote ID, although network remote ID can be sourced from the aircraft depending upon what rules you're operating under. Now, there may be some other entities in play, but they're not required by the regulations and uh, not required by the external technical standards. For instance, a supplemental data service provider. We cannot make remote ID dependent upon a supplemental data service provider, but we could enhance what remote ID provides using SDSPs. Now, finally, by registry, we're denoting a bunch of different functions that will almost certainly all be provided by the same service bureaus. You know, whether they're running on the same CPU cores is irrelevant, obviously. The central function is that of a UAS traffic management UAS service supplier, the USS. And, uh, but because in these slides, we're kind of focusing on the registry function, I've labeled it registry rather than USS. Next slide, please. Okay, this is what ASTM's broadcast grid looks like without drip enhancements. Unverifiable, weakly correlated assertions of who I am, where I am, in what direction I'm going, and how fast I'm doing that. And that's all you get. And network broadcast is a little better because it is a little less constrained. So there's a little more room for uh, verification and there's a little more room for stronger correlation because you can package a bunch of short messages together in one bundle and authenticate the bundle. And so now if one of the messages in the bundle is who I am and another message is where I am, you can now you know, strongly couple those, unlike in the broadcast case. Next slide. Okay, so 
again, our thesis is that RID should be immediately actionable and that that involves a few sub bullets. First off, the information needs to be trustworthy. Second, and this is a stretch beyond what ASTM was thinking, that even if you can't at this instant identify uniquely the operator because you've got his opaque ID string, but you don't have the internet connectivity that would allow you to use that opaque ID string as a key to look him up in a database. Well, if that uh, opaque string is not entirely opaque, but rather can be parsed to indicate which registry it's in, well, now you can know it's in you know the good guy registry. What do I mean by the good guy registry? Let's say I run two registries, registry blue and registry green. Um, there may be people who trust me and who trust the rules that I use to vet operators before I am willing to register them and issue them one of these IDs. And so when they see um, a beacon coming off one of these aircraft that they can't look up who of the millions of registrants it is until they get back to you know, the office where they've got their internet connection, but they can look in their little database on their phone, their database of registries, and see that, oh yeah, this, this aircraft um, is registered within the blue registry, therefore I'm going to trust it. This other aircraft is registered within the green registry, so yeah, I know it is properly registered, but it's in the registry that's used by everybody who goes and buys their drones at Walmart, so I'm not necessarily going to trust them to fly in this sensitive airspace right now. Um, and then the last thing is we think it's really, really important to enable instant communications with somebody who has the ability to influence right now the operation of the aircraft. Because let's say I'm an air defense operator, right? And I'm gonna decide whether or not to shoot this thing down. Well, I bet most drone operators would rather get a call from me first uh, so that they would have the opportunity to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stray into this airspace. I will gladly exit it or land rather than be shot down, right? Um, so our idea is to complement existing external standards, be they regulatory or technical, to leverage not only the protocols of the internet and its infrastructure and its services, but even business models um, and obviously IETF expertise. We want to complement the ASTM standard um, to mitigate its shortfalls and support a variety of closely related applications. Our stretch goal, all of the information in the UAS traffic management system and in the UAS remote identification system is operator provided. I say that this is who I am and where I am and where I'm going. I could be lying. Uh, it would be great if we could have some independent confirmation or refutation of that. So if we gateway broadcast grid into network grid, now that would enable both the Europeans and the FAA to lower the bar on small drones and say, you can do network or you can do broadcast, you can do either one, whichever one is more convenient for you. Because if it came out as broadcast initially, it's gonna end up in network. So it's the best of both worlds situation. Furthermore, all of these receivers, whether they be things that we pre-position around the fences of nuclear power plants and air uh, uh, ports, or whether this is you know, uh, crowdsourced smartphones, this will allow us to do multilateration and get independent measurements uh, on where this thing really is, as opposed to where the operator provide message says it is. Next slide, please. Now, um, there are some real issues in the internet that we know and love today, and some of them are made worse by the constraints and vagaries of aeronautical communications. Um, furthermore, because ASTM was pressured by the regulators to support the cell phones that are already in the volunteer firemen's hands, um, we've got to deal with the constraints of one-way Bluetooth 4 advertisement frames that hold at most 24 bytes of payload each, and we can at most concatenate 10 of them together um, to get 224 usable bytes minus whatever we use for uh, error checking. Um, security protocols that require heavy duty cryptographic processing are really challenged by these really tiny platforms. Um, and yet there are enormous uh, safety implications of uh, insecure or unreliable protocols. And finally, there's the issue of aggregation of, of public uh, broadcast information that uh, enables inference of sensitive information such as Flight schedules. Next slide, please. Okay, so our thought is if we can convince ASTM F38.02 to make a couple of very minor tweaks to the ASTM standard, and if we can make some updates to a couple of selected IATF standards that were in need of these updates anyway, um, and jam those two together, then we get what we need. Um, 
Now, because mapping an observed aircraft's physical location to the aircraft's identifier is similar to the inverse problem of mapping an Internet's host identifier, whatever that is, to its logical location, which of course is its IP address, that inspired us to look at HIP. And once we did look at HIP, we realized that that would bring us a bunch of other benefits. Now, I'm well aware that HIP has not gained a tremendous amount of traction, um, although there are some very dedicated users of whom not a lot of people are aware of. Um, anyway, it just seemed like it was a natural match here. So we've got a couple of minor tweaks to ASTM and a couple of updates or enhancements to HIP. First, HIP needs new crypto, and Bob Moskowitz has been working on this. It needs new crypto just for HIP in general, and it needs it specifically here for UAS Remote ID to fit strong signatures and certificates uh, in the very small Bluetooth packets. Now, um, I know that certificates is a word that may be somewhat controversial. Um, I'm up for a fight, but not today in our limited time. Um, host identity tags need to be extended to allow for a registry hierarchy. This is what Bob calls hierarchical host identity tags. That solves a lot of problems for US Remote ID. Um, we have integrated the baseline ASTM stuff from Gabriel Cox of Intel, Open Drone ID code, and prototyped some of our extensions. We've actually flown it more than once at the New York uh, test site, and we've updated those prototypes to authenticate UAS RID claims, and as soon as the weather permits, we'll fly again. Next slide, please. Okay, um, if you buy most of those requirements from the previous presentation, Almost all of them are easily satisfied if the UAS identifier is a hierarchical hit that's in DNS and in Whois, and if you access Whois with RDAP, and if you populate Whois with EPP, and if you access control, both the Gozindas and the Gozadas with XACML. Next slide, please. Okay, the two bold ones at the top in green, these are additional requirements that are easily satisfied if the hierarchical hit has Bob's proposed new crypto, which is uh, KitchEck based. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this is what we can do if we do the putative uh, design that we've been working on. We can authenticate that messages really came from their alleged source without needing internet connectivity. Next slide. Obviously, that's just signatures. Okay, here's a thing that you know ASTM hadn't contemplated, the regulators hadn't contemplated. This is the idea of having multiple registries, and just on the basis of which registry you prove you are in, which can be done with a one-way broadcast, um, we know whether you're in the registry of good guys. Next slide, please. Obviously, in order to do this, we're going to require an operator registration process. Next slide. We're also gonna require an individual aircraft registration process. Now, one thing I wanna be clear on, I should have said this earlier, the UAS ID, even though it's called a UAS ID, isn't, it's a UA ID. It is specific to the aircraft. If I am one operator and I have two ground control stations and I operate four aircraft, well, then I have four UAS IDs, one for each of those aircraft. Now, that's at any given time. Maybe those are static, or maybe those are dynamic. But at any instant, any aircraft that's in the air has an ID for that aircraft. Anyway, the aircraft registration needs to be mediated through the operator registration because I might sell my drone. And it needs to now be re-registered to show it's binding to its um, new operator. Uh, uh, yeah, great. Um, and this is, once I've got an ID through RID, I want to look up information. And um, it's important that this be access controlled and we, we believe that RDAP and XACML can do that for us. Um, and the whole idea of the registries has been largely punted by everybody involved in uh, UAS Remote ID, and they're thinking that they need to invent the whole new thing and build whole new things. They don't. The internet already has ways of registering names. A UAS identifier is nothing but another name in another new namespace, and we've got protocols, infrastructure, and business models for registering names. And I propose that we use them. Next slide, please. Okay, now here's, here's uh, one of our stretch goals. If the observer actually has not just hits, but honest to God, hip on his smartphone, and if the pilot has hip on his smartphone, then bang, the observer can reach out and touch the pilot's smartphone, you know, UA flying app, 
and tell them that they need to talk. Next slide, please. Uh, and there it is. This is the idea that the observer sees a thing, identifies the thing through RID, says, I got to talk to the guy who's flying that thing to ask him what he's doing and maybe ask him to exit that airspace right now. Next slide. Okay, these are identifier requirements as opposed to generic drip requirements. These are satisfied if it's a hierarchical hit in DNS and in who is. That's all of them except for one of the, uh, the, the bullets below. Next slide. If it is a single use hierarchical hit, then it satisfies the last one, which is to um, not facilitate adversarial correlation of patterns of life because it's only a single use identifier. However, it's a single use identifier. We're gonna have a lot of them being registered from moment to moment. So we've gotta have uh, scalable, timely registration methods. Next slide. Okay, and, and this is the last piece that, that Bob has added to this. The idea that if we, if we enable these gateways from broadcast grid to network grid, um, now not only do we get a best of both worlds uh, scenario, where either can be supported by the UAS operator and yet everybody gets the situational awareness that they want, it also gives us the opportunity for multilateration, which would probably be performed by a supplemental data service provider. Now, really, I, you know, I've only shown two observers here, that's because I don't want my slides to get all that busy, but multilateration to get a 3D position requires at least four observers. Now, when you keep in mind that some of these observers will lie and others will just have inaccurate measurements, uh, the more the merrier. Next slide. Okay, last slide this is. This is an urgent need. Um, the stakeholder needs that are recognized by the regulators will influence the standards that the manufacturers will follow and we're gonna be stuck with this for years. Um, the situational awareness will only be useful if the information is immediately actionable. That implies all those bullets there in the middle. A lot can be achieved by uh, making minor adaptations to existing internet standards uh, and, and reusing existing internet infrastructure. Now, the group that's been doing this so far here, Adam, Bob, me, some programmers that work with us, we've gone quite a ways down the hip road, but this doesn't have to be hip. Again, I'm sensitive to the fact that hip doesn't have a lot of traction. Uh, and if other people have other things that will genuinely meet the need, uh, we're all ears and we desperately need your help. Thank you. Done, done. Thank you. So let's move to the queue. Um, I see Jim, Jim Breed. Jim, we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Two questions. When do you need to expect this architecture framework to be completed? Uh, what's the sort of time frame for that? And then there'll be a follow up question in a moment. Um, that's a hard one for me because I am, I am as yet unwise in the ways of the IETF, right? We are trying to move as fast as we can because the regulators are moving. Okay. okay. Well, um, um, the next issue is much more problematical. Um, if you look at what happens in ICANN in the context of dealing with RDAP and VUIS issues, law enforcement and anti-abuse people are already screaming very, very loudly that these are a problem. Getting timely access to information about who holds a domain name is already problematical. And ICANN has been arguing about that for about 20 years now and still hasn't come up with a solution. A second consideration there is going to be that if you've got any sort of information that identifies a human being, that's the result of these lookups, the GDPR will apply, the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation, and that will get you into a huge world of hurt. So I think it'll be very, very important to have a dialogue with the data protection authorities and also encourage the aviation authorities to have in contact with the data protection authorities, particularly in Europe, but not only there. Thank yeah, you. one of the things that absolutely astonished me is that the European Union Aviation Safety Agency 
required the ASTM type one identifier, which is the static manufacturer assigned ID. And you know, Europe is so hard over on privacy. And yet here's this thing that I'm gonna beacon uh, in clear text to anybody who's within range to receive it every time I fly. Uh, this seems to me quite counterintuitive. And one of the areas in which I'm hoping we can help the regulators is to better balance the um, immediate actionability uh, and the trustworthiness uh, of the information for those legitimate authorities who have a need to know with the protection of PII. Yeah, I'm just saying this is going to be a very, very difficult problem and I don't see an easier quick solution here. Roger that. So maybe next, Hannes. Yeah, you mentioned in your presentation uh, a prototype, and I was wondering whether you produced a, a short write-up or a blog post on with some details on what you actually did in that prototype. I would be interested to learn more about it. I will get together with the guys who actually built it with, uh, you know, my annoying supervision. And uh, we'll put together something to to uh, to show what we did. Thank you for the suggestion. Next, Stuart. Uh, no, I forgot. Um, Mr. De Silva. Thanks, so, uh, just a small question. Uh, so you mentioned uh, before uh, the issues inherent in the internet regarding mobility. How this is gonna impact? Uh, the remote ID, and have you done any analysis on that to see if is this real issue uh, that you should be worried or not? I'm sorry, I had a little bit of an audio problem. Could you say again what specific issue you want me to comment on? Uh, you mentioned in your slide about the mobility. It's an inherent problem with the internet. And now, do you see this as also a problem for the use of the remote ID? A protocol in the architecture they are proposing or should not be worried about that in this particular environment? Yeah, so um, I first got involved with IP mobility quite a while back in the early days of mobile IP and we were doing it specifically for aircraft. You know, we had aircraft that were flying along, which meant that they were handing off from, from one uh, base station to another base station and these base stations were often operated by different organizations with different security policies, different routing realms, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it was pretty challenging. And um, although there have been great strides made in IP mobility in the last uh, uh, 20 years, um, I still don't see um, secure arbitrary mobility, you know, user mobility, terminal mobility, service mobility as being one of the strong suits of the internet. And yet it's fundamentally what aviation is all about is, is mobility. So I, I can't say anything more specific than that, um, but uh, happy to, to have more specific detailed technical interactions on the mailing list. So next, Stuart. So I'm um, rather surprised about the sort of the uh, Every vehicle that we don't hear you. Uh, every vehicle that has flown for the last hundred years has had its um, identity as a matter of public information, big letters painted on the side. Every vehicle that drives in the street and every ship that sails on the sea uh, has its uh, identity as public information. I'm really surprised that drones should be a special case here. And um, I, I could understand the Europeans taking the position of, um, of backing the 100-year tradition, was more than 100 years for ships. Um, as to GDPR, GDPR is personally uh, identifiable information is the primary concern, and this isn't really personal information. This is the identif identification of a vehicle. That's mostly correct. Um, however, the broadcast information includes not only the location of the vehicle, but also the location of the ground control station and the pilot, which means you know, uh, mobs with baseball bats can descend upon him. 
And while they won't learn his mother's maiden name from the information, um, you know, I, I think they'll be learning information that still can place him at risk. And I do know that a lot of, uh, a lot of the pilots are very concerned about this. Uh, well, certainly I've never heard uh, anything like that over here in the, in the United Kingdom. Never, ever. We, we fly. Uh, I'm part of the model flying community over here, and uh, I have never heard anyone being at risk. Uh, I, I don't see the information out, right? If, if there is new information which may not be public, what's the reason to, you know, also make the well-known pre-existing 100-year tradition public information also private? Who was talking? I think it's... Oh, Tolis Eckert, sorry. Yeah, um, I, I guess I am foreseeing, as many of the pilots with whom I have spoken are foreseeing, the following scenario. Somebody does something bad with a drone. And then somebody else subsequently is seen, well, not the somebody, the drone is seen flying. And it, it, it is easy to envision um, the scenario. I don't know how likely it is in reality, but it is easy to envision the scenario where because of the bad act of somebody at a stadium, um, we get this you know, mob behavior. Anyway, I, I just think that it's, it's often easy to provide the information to those with the need to know while not providing um, so much information to those who don't have the need to know. No, that is not the established tradition. Established tradition is not need to know. Exactly. This is Stuart. So I fly uh, model aircraft within the Gatwick um, control area with the full permission of, uh, of Gatwick. And we fly ex in, in exactly the sort of place where people would have launched when they did the um, denial of service attack on, um, on Gatwick. And there has never, ever been, um, been an issue. The closest we've ever had is one police officer saying, uh, I wish the CIA had told us you had permission to be here. We do this every week, and it's fully legal, and it's fully open. Okay, I guess um, we're probably not going to resolve this here, um, but I do want to draw a couple of somewhat finer distinctions. There is the public visibility of simply the identifier itself is one thing, and then there is the visibility of the information about the operator, you know, name, rank, serial number, home address, whatever. Um, those are two different things and, and require, you know, different levels of uh, protection. Uh, and also, I just do want to point out that that the EU and the US have taken somewhat different regulatory approaches to the problem. And I'm just trying to come up with technical solutions that are flexible enough and broad enough to support uh, both models and possibly still better models that will accommodate everyone. Okay, so I suggest that we move briefly to the next in the line, which is um, Shuai Tsao, and I apologize if I mispronounced. No, that's fine. That is a Shuai Tsao. That is fine. Yeah, uh, I I think I agree with the Stuart uh, with the, some of the public information, which some information was not a, available to the public regarding the June flight. Uh, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Based on what I'm reading, um, the vision of the FAA is trying to integrate the general aviation, um, let's say, ATC controls and all the commands with the drone in the future. Uh, either way, which way they're taking, so we don't know. But uh, I think uh, uh, for the uh, architecture uh, you presented here, would that be possible to mention or to integrate some of the stuff from FAA ATC control with the, the drone control? Yes, um, a thing that I'm hearing a lot is the phrase UTM is the future of ATM. Aviation authorities uh, are extremely risk averse. And so it is very difficult to experiment with uh, new concepts in uh, air traffic control. Um, whereas, um, you know, small unmanned aircraft systems have been regarded as, as non-threatening. And we've pretty much had the field uh, free to play for the past few years. 
So um, the things that we are doing using more modern technologies and more modern command and control concepts that involve distributed rather than top-down centralized, um, they're very, very much thinking about you know, if they work out for uh, small drones, let's try to use them on large manned aircraft as well. And I would hope very much that the work we do in DRIP, that at least some of it will be um, applicable to that broader aviation community. But more specific than that, I can't foresee at this time. Thank you. Um, next, Charles. I just wanted to quickly have, get or to the uh, the point we were talking about about being something you know transparent or secret, right? Uh, beside the need to uh, engineer it in a way that both can be done depending on the needs, I think you know we had prior you know examples in the IETF of having as an organization opinions about you know privacy or and which we haven't done a lot about transparency, right? If I'm thinking about being a, just a normal you know, person in the in the future being subject to a lot of you know flying drones, I would very much lean out and say, I'd, I'd love we would start having opinions about transparency, right? So not only representing the interests of maybe the uh, the governments or so that uh, may not be the ones that we as a community may want to have. Thanks. Thank you. Here, here. So Anyone has to to do. Anyone wants to answer to that, or sure. I'm moving. I, to... I think that's a great point. Um, transparency is going to be very important because these things um, do present risks, and even above and beyond the actual risks they present, there are you know just fears and concerns. And I, I haven't seen as much discussion of transparency within IETF in general as I have seen of privacy. So. Maybe we will be one of the first to to explore that uh, balancing issue. Okay, next, um, Stefan, I guess. So um, I have some limited experience with uh, FAA man carrying regulation work, and uh, I mean, when when you just look at at things that are obvious to at least to those of us who have taken a flight lesson at some point in their lives or whatever when when you look at things like like uh the 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 most recent regulatory big regulatory change uh in the man carrying aviation was introduction of a thing called adsb which is basically the man carrying uh companion to remote id and that took like 20 years right to from we should do this to, yeah, let's face it in as mandatory as of 2020. And it's using, you know, literally uh, 19, 19 something uh, technologies today. Yeah, and it's just being phased in. So whatever we in DRIP do, I think, I think we should stick to our guns and make this drone stuff workable and ignore the man carrying uh, stuff for the foreseeable future because the, the timelines those guys are were operating under are just an order of magnitude too long for us. Uh, you know, it's it's not something where where uh, where you will raise a lot of interest and you will get so much pushback. So I I, I would suggest to stick to the drones. Yeah, that's a valid point. I think the only um, area where, though, we're going to see an intersection between the two is this whole notion of urban air mobility and air taxis that um, will not have the human pilot on board. Maybe there'll be a remote human pilot, or maybe it will be automatically, you know, autonomously piloted, um, and they're going to be operating at low altitudes. So that's kind of in the intersection of the different worlds of traditional uh, manned aviation and um you know low altitude uh, unmanned aircraft okay so is that the last question anyone got a, a last thing to say no so i will say uh, that there's been a lot of discussion on the jabber that um, I'm going to try to capture after the fact. I'm going to keep the window open and try to fill the um, 
the ether pad and try to get it down like high level. But I believe the jabber is being saved, but there was some really good discussion on identifiers and everything there. I just wanted to point that out. Okay. So, well, I'm not able to see the jabber, either, but um, it's great. Um, so please go on with that discussion. In this case, in this case, if you copy the jabber room, please make sure that in the etherpad is noted jabber room. Understood. Not in to the. Thank you. And it was Eric, by the way. Okay. So, um, well, that's great that we have a ongoing discussion. Um, so. Let me ask everyone has um, registered to the uh, as, uh, put his name to the blue sheet. I hope so. So otherwise, you still have very uh, four minutes to do that. So please do it right now. Um, and then to conclude this um, discussion, I think it was. Um, it, um, I mean, we had some great discussion at least um, at the mic, and uh, even more interesting on the Jabber. So that's. Very, very much the way we expect uh, those interim meetings and I mean this virtual meeting to work. Um, the, as mentioned earlier, we have a proposed milestone, which is um, to complete those documents so that they can be ready for adoption. And to I mean it's not I mean the goal is not to to have those adopted, but to have those ready to be sent to working group last call. And we really want to have that. July, which means that, I mean, things has to be ready um, um, April, May, or, um, and then we will have to start to to go through the solution space. Um, is that a reasonable schedule for everyone? I, I'm hearing none. Still here. Um, I, I'm eager to get reviews because I I know that the drafts need a lot of improvement, but I need guidance on you know what improvements to make, and I will be as expeditious as possible in making them once I get the feedback. And if I could just make one part, yes. of the I hope that this is the last drip working group meeting in which I will speak for such a large fraction of the airtime. <laughs> You did a good uh, job. I, I think we are. I think we're not using queue management right now. Um, the timeline looks aggressive to me. ATF timelines are always aggressive and never kept. Um, but what's even more more problematic to me is that the regulatory timeline is even stricter. Um, I wonder whether the ITF is the right organization to do this work. To be very blunt, because we are not fast typically. Yeah, that's, are we on? That's legit. Um, I, I have told the people with whom I'm working that the IETF moves rather slowly, not as slowly as the FAA, but slowly. Um, and so there's kind of like two parallel tracks going on. There's the prototyping and the testing that we are doing, which um, doesn't need a standard to support it. It's, you know, it's technology research and development and demonstration to stakeholders and and so on. Um, but I just think that the IETF is, if nothing else, the best source of the technology to solve this problem because the aviators were unfamiliar with the things that the IETF already has that provide 90 plus percent of the solution if merely suitably integrated. By the way, just one comment. I don't think that IETF is slow. The, the question is how many cycles can the people whose expertise is needed provide in what time frame? Right? So if you're looking for the expertise here and you want to have it faster, I think you need to go uh, picking on those people that you need contributions for to, to speed up the process. But that would have to happen outside the IETF as well. Hi, hi, this is Hannes. I don't, I don't know if anyone manages the queue, but um, I'm not sure whether regulators will actually be really that fast. Um, like in Europe, uh, um, I think there are currently other problems than uh, that type of regulation. So let's see whether that's actually 
not be the case also in other other uh, jurisdictions. Yes, I agree. Um, on the other hand, uh, the last time when I've seen even a moderately sized project in the IATF to be advertised to be completed in a year or two, it usually, you know, usually it takes five, right? It, it, let's be honest with ourselves. Do we have that time? Um, so, so we're not talking about a month granularity here. We're talking about a year granularity. I remember BFD was only going to be three meetings. So, well, I, I suggest that we try to keep that um, deadline. And um, I mean, the, this could be achieved um, if if we review the those documents. I, I don't see any difficulties in those documents. Um, not technical difficulties. So, I would say we should try to 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 get that uh, timeline. And I think we're almost closing the meeting. Daniel, I think the issue, there's a lot of people that are on this call, this is Michael, that um, uh, who are coming to this the first time and had a lot of opinions in the Jabber, for instance, about the privacy and the trade-offs and other things like that. And so I actually think that the requirements a document, I think that's the, that's the thing that we're gonna get stuck up on and could push us into five years. Um, and I think that's the part that, we need to uh, aggressively come back to yeah. uh, to get right and to shop around. And as Torla said, to get the opinions of people who are not directly involved today, uh, but might object at ITF last call. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I would like to avoid is that um, because the deadline, I mean, if we are advertising that we are slow and people come say, um, might envision that okay then i have time to um i'd like the comments to come as early as possible so we can address them um one by one rather than having long cycles with no reviews and then working group last call then we got all the all the comments so what i would say is that we should not consider to wake up at within three months so the sooner the better Michael gave you a good way to uh, divide and conquer, right? So you can try to focus on getting out as fast as possible first version of a proposed solution or other, you know, normative recommendations. And to speed that up, you just have to basically make sure that the people whose input you need are fast reacting, right? And that is in the working group's phase, it's, it's, it's fairly easy, I think. Um, the, the main issue comes when it goes for ITF and ISG review. Mm. I think the, um, the tricky issue always is to describe the uh, architecture and the requirements. Uh, the solution always is uh, is easier once you know what you're actually trying to solve. Yeah, <laughs> and I, th and I think you started I think with the solution first. The solution uh, actually does, uh, you know, have to wait for all the requirements. It may actually predate it, even if it then only solves part of the requirements. There is always. Uh, an easier way to do a second version of 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 a solution than you know necessarily to wait for five years and delay adoption. So may yeah, I think but uh, that would be useful to separate out um, the requirement to ensure that um, the regulations as they are are properly represented against uh, ID uh, versus and then separately the. Uh, uh, debatable issues about um, what they ought to be uh, so that uh, an initial version can get out to ensure that uh, whatever the regulations are in any given jurisdiction that's handled and then it, it will take certainly some time to resolve unresolved issues okay so well uh, sure so, sorry can i just uh, add one more comment so um it's uh, April, it's end of April, or middle of April, or do we have any specific date? Oh, I mean, um, so the way it's gonna work is um, we're gonna say, do you think those documents are ready? I mean, it should be adopted in April. And so there is a two weeks call so that the people can say yes or no. And, um, and at that time, it's, 
the working group, I mean, the, the document is going to be adopted by the working group. It means that the working group is focusing on those documents to, to produce them. And then when the documents are over, finished, we believe so, we proceed to what we call a working group last call. So then we issue a working group last call saying to the mailing list, we think the document is ready to move forward. So is anyone, uh, I mean, uh, we uh, does anyone want to raise any comment? And then the document moved to the ISG, which is at the end uh, end up as a an R with an RFC number. Uh, you've missed a large stage out of that. It will go through a whole series of of, of um, area uh, uh, IETF to a general public review and area reviews as before it gets to the ISG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Um... But I mean, uh, within the group, we don't. I mean, uh, once we move the document outside the working group, it's uh, there is a. I mean, there, there is a review process that ends up with the RFC number. Anyway, this is Eric here. Uh, you are free to continue using this Webex room for a while. I think it will be extended uh, automatically. But uh, Daniel and Matt, if you can close the meeting, close the minutes. Uh, and feel free to continue okay. talking about any topics, uh, like if you were in the hallway, right? Uh, no toilet, okay. but obviously, the discussion. Okay. Thank you so much for, this, for the discussion. I'm leaving. I need to go to another call. Okay. Thank you, Eric. One quick, one quick yeah, thank you, Matt. This is Jim. Um, this is for you, Daniel. Uh, I think this might still be a necessity for you to ask the working group to formally adopt these documents if it's not really done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to to ask. That's the working group call. F I mean, we will have so adoption. So technically, the chairs can do it. It is normal procedure for the um, to ask, but the chairs can do it on their own uh, um, uh, authority if they decide that's the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, um, okay. So, well, the expected agenda so, is that we're going to work on. Um, on those requirements, I mean, I'd, I'd like one version that uh, takes the comments and the feedbacks we received from this meeting, and then to have a, so, um, I mean, a, another version. And this version is expected to be, um, um, we we expect to have a call for adoption for that next version. So it's that's the the the, the thing we expect in April. So it's in in one week. Um, and then, I mean, uh, it's just a, a formalize uh, things. Uh, then it becomes a working group document. So that's the um, that's how how things are, are going to work. But we would like um, we expect that the working group is going to be focused on those work, um, so that we we can estimate that in July, or even earlier. Yeah, we think this document is now ready. We, as a working group. Does it clarify some uh, some of the some of the questions? Yeah, Stu here. I'll be the first to say that even though I have put a lot of thought into them, these my two drafts at least are not yet ready for working group adoption. However, I believe that if I incorporate the feedback that I received in the last week, plus the feedback that I received in the last two hours, uh, and that I hope to receive you know, this weekend, um, I think at that point, they should be ready for working group adoption and get more people tearing into them. Uh, sure, so uh, I will try my best to upload my commitment to you. Uh, it just, uh, uh, there is a SE, the HPD meeting the whole next 10 days. So um, expect some delays, but uh, I, will, I will try my best to, to give it to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There is no, I mean, um, it's fine. I mean, as long as people don't wait three weeks, it's fine, I would say. Um, I mean, uh, three months. I mean, we would like to be focused on those for, for now. So that's, uh, that's the, the real message. And um, I, I'd like to thank everyone as well as um, the Secretariat for making all this um, happening. Uh, 
Um, and um, I suggest that we close the meeting and that we have this continuous work uh, through the interim meetings as well. So um, if you have a, I, I'm going to start a doodle um, next week, probably. Um, if you have a specific time zone, um, please drop me an email. Uh, currently, the time zone we're considering is um, um, East Coast and Europe. Um, if you're outside those zone, um, I mean, please let let me know so we can't have try to to find an appropriate schedule. Right. So I'm waiting for your feedbacks and um, see you on the mailing list and during the interim meetings. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.